Hello and thank you for watching my video. My name is Astrid Krasnici. I'm CCNA and CCMP certified instructor. In this video, we are covering interconnecting Cisco network devices, part one, ICND one. This is exam 100, 105. Now we're moving on to section 1.7 that says apply troubleshooting methodologies to resolve problems. Perform fault isolation and document, resolve or escalate, and verify monitor resolution. Now this uh, section it only describes about methodologies, methods to troubleshoot. Because while we're doing the troubleshooting, pretty much we're going to go and configure and, and learn about troubleshooting as we go through our exam, as we go through our course. As you can see, as you can see, the next one, for example, 1.8 says troubleshooting IPv4 addressing. Then we got troubleshooting IPv6 addressing. Then we have, a, for example, tr troubleshooting interface and cable issues and troubleshooting inter-switch connectivity, troubleshooting port security. As you can see, there's a lot of troubleshooting as we're going to learn. But in this side, we're just going to learn about the methods. So troubleshooting methods. Troubleshooting method is a guiding principle that determines how you move through the phases of the troubleshooting process. So for example, if you have a look, we define a problem. So that's the first thing that we check. OK, we have a problem. We gather the information. After we gather the information, we analyze the information that we have gathered. Then we move on to eliminate potential causes. So we say, OK, well, that's not going to pose the problem. That's not the problem. That's not the problem. That's not the problem. And after that, we propose a hypothesis. After that, we, we test our hypothesis and we solve the problem and document the solution. All troubleshooting process includes the elements of gathering and analyzing information eliminating possible causes and formulating and testing hypotheses. So for example, after we gathered information, enough information, we analyzed it, we eliminated some causes and we propose hypothesis. So we say, okay, well, that could be the problem. So let's test that and see if we can fix it. Now, once you do that and they didn't fix it, for example, you always go back and revert it to what you did. What you don't want to do, and, and do one test at a time. You don't want to go and, and troubleshoot like five or six things saying, okay, well, that I'll, try, I'll see if that fixes, I'll see if that fixes, and do the whole at the same time. Because then you won't know. Maybe you fix the problem, but then you won't know which one fixed the problem. So you need to propose one hypothesis saying, okay, well, that could be the problem. Let me see if they can fix that by changing that. If that, that didn't change it, then you need to go back and undo what you just did. So you test hypothesis, then you can go back and eliminate more potential causes and maybe go back. You need to go back and gather more information and you start the process again. Time you spend on each of the phase and how you move from phase to phase can be significantly different from a person to person. More experience you're going to have, you're going to move on very quickly from phase to phase. More, more, less experience you have, less experience you have, then you're going to be stuck and maybe you're going to spend more time on the, each phase. In a typical troubleshooting process, for a complex problem, you would continually move between the different processes, gathering some information, analyzing it, eliminating some possibilities, gather more information, formulate a hypothesis, and test it. It's important that you document every time you gather information, analyze it, eliminate potential causes, propose hypotheses. All of these are documented. Structured approach. If you do not use a structured approach, but move between the phases randomly, you might eventually find the solution, but the process will be very inefficient. A structured approach to troubleshooting is more predictable, results in the end, and it will make it easier to pick up the process where you left it off in a later stage or hand it over to somebody else. So if you're not experienced and you just go around and try this and try that, you might come up to the problem, but you might even create another problem that you don't even know about it. So a structured approach is the way to go. And you can take it, you can, uh, because you're documenting it as well. So you can actually take it, uh, you can uh, continue it later or hand it over to maybe, maybe you will hand it over. Maybe you are in the first line troubleshooting. Maybe you're going to hand it over to the second line troubleshooters and even further on to uh, um, the hunters. Shoot from the hip, great troubleshooting, <laughs> quickly formulating a first hypothesis that is based on common problem causes and corresponding solution can be very effective in the short run. So for example, if you ever seen the problem, you've seen it, 
same or similar problem is appearing and you know how to fix it, you can do uh, shoot from the hip. Shoot from the hip method, only a little time is spent gathering the information and right away you propose hypothesis, you test the hypothesis and solve the problem. So you're still proposing the hypothesis and testing it. So you, you know, you're not going to analyze the information or eliminate potential causes because you already, as soon as you gather the problem, you've seen that problem before and you pretty much, pretty much know how to fix that problem. So shoot from the hip is commonly deployed by both experienced and ex inexperienced troubleshooters. Elimination type of troubleshooting, the key, uh, the key to structured troubleshooting is elimination. So you eliminate potential causes. A structured troubleshooting method is a guideline that helps you to move through the different phases of troubleshooting process. The key to all tr structured troubleshooting methods is the elimination of the causes. By systematically eliminating possible problems, causes, you can reduce the scope of the problem until you manage to isolate the soul and solve the problem. So you're eliminating, you kind of like what you're doing by gathering information and analyzing, you're eliminating causes. You say, okay, well, that's not the problem. That can't be the problem. That can't be the problem. When you try and eliminate everything, you're going to come up to the solution. Three other troubleshooting methodologies that we have. First is top down. Top down is like if you take the OSI layers and you go through, you, you start with the top layer, like application layer, and you're moving down the layers. Now, depending on what kind of troubleshooting uh, scenario you're facing, um, well, this layer could this this methodology will work. For example, say that you are uh, accessing a web browser, a web page, and you try and access another web page, and then you are you're not able to. Well, there's no point to start the physical layer because uh, the cable is on and the computer is open and all that, and you actually have access to the web, to the internet. So the best troubleshooting methodology will be from top down, from application layer. But you have another layer, another type of methodology for troubleshooting bottom up. Now, if the computer, you have a black screen and the computer is not even even started, there's you can't start the application layer. You have to start the physical layer. Check the computer is plugged in, check that it's turned on, and so on. The best method that we pretty much use every day is divide and conquer. Now, divide and conquer, you start at layer three. We started troubleshooting like pinging or trace route. So, for example, if your ping is unsuccessful, you go down the layers. So, you go network layer, data link layer, and the physical layer. But if the pings are successful, for example, you move up the layers transport, session, presentation, and application. Comparison, and there's another way, good troubleshooting method that we have. Um, if you have two devices and you can put them like this side by side, maybe you can find out where the errors are. Um, this is very good because if you kind of like see how uh, the the running configuration should look like and when you see something odd, you would be able to perform comparison from just head by just remembering how the uh, maybe the running configuration it is. So in this case, we can see the DNS is different in both of the routers. Follow the path, a great method to troubleshoot. Determine the path the packet follow through the network from resource to the, to the destination and track the packets along the path. Now, what you want to do, for example, say that this PC, um, let's just say that this PC cannot ping this laptop. Now, if you can't start right away, maybe you are looking at ACLs and maybe you are looking at the routing table and so on. Now, first thing you need to do is go to this PC and ping yourself. Make sure that you can ping 127.001 so they can test that you actually have a TCP IP stack correctly configured. And then do an IP config, find out what is the gateway IP address and ping that gateway IP address. So see if you can have, uh, if there is a communication in your, lo in your LAN. If there is a communication in LAN, so you can ping the default gateway. The second method is to ping the router but the outside interface, not on the LAN, but the one, some interface that is pointing either towards the internet or to another network. If that's successful, then you should be able to ping the gateway. If that's successful and you can't still ping the gate, uh, you can't ping the destination, then the problem is that the gateway. Another method of troubleshooting is to swap components. You move components physically and observe if the problem moves with the component or not. Imagine that this router has got a problem. Now, the easiest method to troubleshoot, the easiest, I think, it would be to just get another router, same similar configuration, and just swap it and see if the problem goes away. 
if he does, then that, that was the problem with the router. Some of the tools that we have, some of the tools, our tools for troubleshooting, the first one is ping. So the basic purpose of ping is to check the following aspects. We check reachability, round trip timer, and packet loss. Now, round trip timer is the time required from a network communication to travel from the source to destination and back. Now, ping is the main troubleshooting tool that every network engineer will use every day for troubleshooting. So ping, for example, say that we ping 192.168.1.5, as you can see here on the screen. If we ping that, and once we ping it, and we get five dots there, as you can see there, that means that, okay, well, it didn't work, yeah? So there's no reply, we can't, there, there is no reachability from the source to the destination. Um, there could be any problem, that could be the gateway, could be the, the path, the problem, and so on. You don't know where the problem is. You only know that you cannot reach dot five. But when you ping 192.168.1.1, you see five exclamation mark here. Five exclamation mark means that, yep, it did work. You could ping that destination. Another tool that we have for troubleshooting, it is a trace route. Trace route is very cool because with the trace route, with the ping, you, you either know their destination is there or maybe the destination is not there. That's it. You can't really tell what happened. Where did they go right or where did it go wrong? Did I go anywhere? So if you want to see actually the packet going from the source to destination, you use a trace route. Now trace route works by sending remote host a sequence of three UDP datagram with a TTL of one in the IP header and the destination port 33434, the first ping, the second, uh, the second uh, first datagram, the second datagram will get 33435 and the third one will get 33436, destination port number. And the thing is happens here with the ping is that you actually gonna TTL01 will cause the datagram to time out when it hits the first router in the path. So when the and then the router will respond with the ICMP time exceeded message, meaning the datagram has expired. And then you get you add another TTL. So the next three UDP datagram are sent with TTL of two to destination port 33437 up to 33439. After passing the first router, because that's TTL1, he will reduce the first router will reduce that to one. The datagram arrives on the ingress interface on the second router. The router will respond, the second router will respond with ICMP time exceeded message. And you get that. They say, okay, well, that was the first router. Now I, go and I know the destination from second router. And you will continue doing this until you reach the destination. So for example, it will be like this. You ping in from this PC, you ping in this server. As it's going through, you don't really know um, how many, what's, what path am I taking to get to that server? So you put TTL of one, right? And TTL one, when you go to this router, that's your gateway. And the gateway will say, okay, well, um, we'll say time exceeded. It will send you a message back. You say, okay, well, I know the first router, first hop. Now I will increase that TTL to two. So I'll send TTL to two. When it goes, when the fact first packet goes to the router, this router will reduce that to TTL one, and then it will send it to the second router. Now, second router will see TTL zero, and it will say it will send back the time exceeded. Now, this time you put TTL three, so the first router it will reduce that to TTL two, and it goes to this router. This router will reduce it to TTL one, time to live one, and it will send it to the third router. Third router will see it as a zero and then it will send time exceeded. So you're building the path from the source to destination. So if I go to another slide where we're gonna be using, seeing it on the next section, is the IP header. For example, this is, the, this is the time to live here, time to live. So the first device will put, like your PC will put TTL here one, right? And when it goes to the first router, the first router will reduce that TTL to zero and it will send time exceeded. Then you put TTL two, that will go to the first router, First router will reduce that to TTL, TTL1 and send it to the second router. Second router will set TTL0, send it back there and time exceeded. And you keep doing this until you see you reach the destination. Okay. Troubleshoot, another troubleshooting tool that we have is extended ping. Now, when you send the normal ping, the router or any device you're pinging from, it's gonna send it from the closest source or well exit interface to reach, to get to that destination. So for example, um, let me bring this back here. Um, here, for example. 
say say we have this router and this router is connected to this PC and when you ping it usually just normal when you type ping like that now it's going to ping it from this interface that's the closest and that's the exit interface to get to that destination but does it it doesn't really tell you can I ping it from this interface or I'm connected now if you want to ping from that interface you need to use extended ping commands now extended ping commands it's used if, if, to change the source address for example and you start with just ping they don't type the IP address you just start ping and press enter the first question is going to be uh, what protocol do you want to ping from IP yes enter you don't need to type IP you just press enter and you agree with it, whatever is in brackets then the target IP address 192.168.1.1 that's where I'm pinging repeat count how many pings you want to send five what's the size of the ping 100 time in seconds two so sorry time out in seconds two two seconds do you want to extend it command do you want to use extended commands the default is no so if you press enter it's not going to be used, just normal ping so you type y here and you press enter then it will ask you the IP address or the interface. So here you can put like, for example, loopback one or whatever, they're just the name of the interface or the IP address. I'm pinging from 10.1.1.1. And then you can change other things like, for example, type of service, do not fragment bit, uh, validate. Later on, we learn about this rec record as well. But for now, you just press enter, enter, enter until you start pinging. And it says, well, if you receive exclamation mark, happy days everything is working if you see if you see a dot then it's not working um we have a trace route as well same as the ping we had early on we have a extended trace route well it will you kind of like given information target ip address we can change the source ip address where you trace routing from this different address um time out in seconds three seconds and you can change the port numbers we said 33434 is the start port but you can change that if you want and to troubleshoot with Telnet. Now, Telnet is really, really powerful. When you use Telnet to connect to a remote device, the Telnet will use a default port number. And default the port number for Telnet is 23, so TCP 23. But you could use any port numbers from 1 to 65, 535 to test if the destination is listening on that port. So it's kind of like a port scanning. So you can do Telnet like normal. You will type Telnet, IP address, but if you don't type anything, that's just going to be 23 there. But if you put 80, that means I'm checking port 80 if the destination is listening on port 80. So try and 10.222 port 80. Open. And as you can see, after I close it, I can see that, yes, the destination did listen on port 80. Thank you for watching this section. 1.7. Apply troubleshooting the methodologies to resolve problems. Perform fault isolation and document. Resolve or escalate. Verify and monitor resolution. Please have a look at my other videos and don't forget to subscribe. This has been Astrid Krasnici. Bye-bye.